Hi and welcome. My name is Marissa Reckman and I am CEO at Agate Labs and I am very pleased to be here with you today taping our environmental panel discussion for our 2022 edition of our Agate Tech Talks. And along with me, I'm here with some very esteemed key panelists. I'm here welcoming Stacey Thigason, who is president of the Environmental Services Association of Alberta and also principal of JSK Consulting. Welcome, Stacey. Thank you. I'm also joined by Kelly Zadko, who is the current president of the Canadian Land Reclamation Association Alberta chapter, as well as the vice president of the national chapter, and also vice president of business development for North Shore Environmental. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you. And I am joined by Chris Lubicki, who is former president, CEO, and director at Modern Resources. Thank you for joining us, Chris. My pleasure. So before uh, we get into conversation and before each of them does a little brief overview of themselves and their experience, I do want to recognize that today is International Women in STEM Day. So Chris, I'm sorry for your loss. You, you, don't, you, <laughs> you don't get to participate, but Stacy, Kelly, not just for yourselves, but for all of those that you represent through your associations at your companies, um, congratulations for being two females who represent women in the sciences. And to everybody else, we congratulate you as well. And we hope that you continue to do the work that you're doing day in and day out and also set the standard for so many other individuals and females interested in going into STEM. So today's panel is on unity in the environmental Canadian landscape. We're gonna have a lot of conversation. The time will go by pretty quickly, and so we will have a Q&A session at uh, the Tech Talks themselves. We'll be opening the dialogue, but we're also hoping, hoping that this just sets the stage for future conversations about the Canadian environmental landscape. And we continue fostering these presentations that bring forth a collaborative discussion and highlights the good work that's being done now, as well as where we can lead into the future. So. Before we get into this discussion, I'm gonna have each of you just do a brief little overview of yourselves and give our viewers a little bit of an understanding of your experience and history and um, why you're here today. So Stacy, do you wanna start us off? Sure, I'd be happy to. So my name is Stacy Thagason, as Marissa had said. Um, I have about 20 years experience in decommissioning um, upstream oil and gas facilities. I'm a principal at JSK Consulting and in 2004 our company decided to join the Environmental Services Association of Alberta um, and since that point in time we've strongly supported their mandates and the vision they have for the environment sector. Uh, I was fortunate enough in 2017 to be elected to the board. In 2018 I was elected as vice president and then in 2019 uh, I took over the role as president and that's the role I currently have. So that's my background. Thank you, Stacy and Kelly. Hi, I'm Kelly Zadko, and I work currently with North Shore Environmental Consultants as the Vice President of Business Development. As Marissa noted, I have been in the environmental industry for over 20 years myself, and most of the work that I do is related to liability management currently. Um, I am the current president of the Alberta chapter of the Canadian Land Reclamation Association, and I've been in that role for, this is my fourth year going into my fourth year, and I've been on the board for uh, five years, and um, I am currently the vice president of the National Association as well, and um, I've been involved with several different organizations um, over the past couple decades, and, and definitely hoping that the next year for the CLRA is uh, a big one as we're moving towards uh, an operational, from an operational board to a governance board, so. Thanks, Kelly, and Chris. Uh, well, I went, I've been in the energy industry for uh, over 40 years. I started as an engineer. I think most people in the industry know me from my uh, investment banking days. I, was, uh, I had three partners. We founded an investment banking firm called Waters & Co., which we sold to the Bank of Nova Scotia in 2005. And most recently, uh, with some colleagues, we started an energy firm called Modern Resources in uh, January of 2013. It was sold to Tourmaline in 2020. And, uh, and besides producing oil and gas, we had a very strong focus on environmental issues mm -hmm. and became very well uh, known for that. And because of that, uh, we became very involved in advocacy of the energy industry. And uh, my objective was to uh, inform people because it's a complicated uh, subject, energy and environment. Uh, and to calm the conversation down because it's become such an emotional, polarized discussion. Uh, so we worked hard at trying to inform people and try to calm the conversation down. It's an important subject. 
Yeah, I, I could not say that better myself, and that's in large part why we're here today. And so, you know, we're, we're gonna we're gonna talk through many different pieces of that that conversation. Um, and for those of you that are uh, have been lucky enough to also sit through Chris's presentation that will be airing just before this panel. Um, we were pre-taping this portion, so uh, if you have seen it, then you've already heard him him just speak to so many important. Um, factual and evidence-based conversations about why this dialogue needs to go forward. Uh, but if you haven't, then I, I urge you to get in contact with us so that we can continue that conversation forward because the presentation is so well done. And, and again, we'll hit on Thank parts you. of that. You're welcome. And, and much like myself, Chris, I know that you've got ties into Ontario. You've got some family ties in Quebec. You've, you've lived throughout um, Canada. I, I grew up in Thunder Bay. I came out here looking for job opportunities because after I graduated, I really... It, the opportunities themselves did not present themselves in the sciences the way that I wanted in Thunder Bay. And at that point in time, um, I left and came out west, right, and obviously have not returned. <laughs> but um, my heart and soul, in large part, are, are definitely tied to that area of the country. I love the Great Lakes. I love the outdoors. I do love the environment. Um, I ran a Kids for Saving Earths Club, uh, my local school, when I was quite young, right, and we were out saving whales and adopting pieces of the rainforest. And, um, and so one of the things that I always find fascinating in the conversation across Canada is that moving here to Alberta, and I have been here for, for a vast number of years now, but moving here to Alberta, um, many individuals across Canada right now have these preconceived notions of what we all believe as Albertans and for individuals that live in this province and certainly any individual that works within the oil and gas industry in any capacity, right? And sadly, I think a lot of these preconceived notions miss the mark on what's actually happening. And I've had the luxury of, you know, throughout my career being involved so intimately in the environmental industry and the services, seeing day in and day out people devote their livelihoods and their jobs to trying to protect and and enhance and foster an environment that we can be proud of for future generations. And yet when I look at what I see in social media or in different outlets, or when I pick up the phone and I talk to family in other provinces, or I talk to friends, the conversation that I get is so vastly different. And it's sad because you know, I think there's so many of us that sit here in this province and think to ourselves, we care too. You know, we, we want a better future. You know, I, I don't have children of my own, but so many others do. And I know that it's important for us to know that we are leaving behind something that is better served for them. I don't know anybody who doesn't care. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we want to talk about today, right? We want to talk about um, changing that tune to get people to understand that it matters to us as well. Um, but we also realize that there needs to be a path forward that's collaborative. So let's start by talking about the memberships, both CLRA and ESA, so that we can get um, all of the individuals that are, are tuning in to understand who makes up the membership and who do you represent, because we want that to really resonate across the country and people to start to be aware of all of the individuals that do work in the environmental industry. And also, I know, Stacey, you were mentioning just before this, we have a severe job and labor shortage in this industry right now. We've seen talent leave and exit with the recent downturns and of course with COVID, and we need to get people back working in these industries. We need hands to be able to do the work. So Stacy and Kelly, do you wanna give us a little bit of an overview of ESA and CLRA and your representation, who you're made up of, and, and just you know what kind of engagement you need from individuals to get involved in the environmental industry? Sure, you bet. Do you want you go ahead. Go? I'll go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, East has been around a long time. So the Environmental Services Association of Alberta was formed in 1987. It's had a few different names over those years, but uh, 2022, we're celebrating our 35th anniversary. So um, I think it speaks to all the points you're saying. Albertans do care. And, you know, the fact that an Environmental Services Association has been around in this province for 35 years speaks to that. Um, we currently have 220 corporate members, um, and the vast majority are based in Alberta, but there are numerous of you know, multinational sometimes and national organizations that um, have joined our association. The groups that um, are our members are labs, Agate, for example, consulting companies like 
JSK and North Shore. Um, we also have members who provide equipment and waste management services. Um, we have legal, regulatory uh, firms that work with all aspects of the environmental sector. So being in Alberta, the vast majority of our members work in oil and gas. But we also do forestry, mining, government and infrastructure work as well. So um, I do feel that ESA covers a lot of sectors in the province. And then as an association, what we try to offer our membership is you know, regulatory reviews and updates and professional development and educational courses. Um, ESA also tries to have strong communications with government relations. Um, we feel that we have a lot of members who have a lot of professional experience. A lot of our members belong to um, professional boards and they've got the expertise. So we want to ensure that we can maintain strong relationships with all levels of government. Um, and the best example of that would be recently with the Alberta Site Rehabilitation Program. ESA had to fight pretty hard to get a seat at the table. We were not the first invited to the table, <laughs> um, which won't surprise many here, but we did manage to get a seat at the table um, at the Industry Advisory Committee. So we could, our goal was to take back the feedback, perspectives, ideas that our members had to the government and let them know what we thought, um, what our members thought of the program and how they could improve it. Um, and then I think what ESA probably for, especially in Alberta, what ESA's really well known for is we host two conferences, symposiums a year. So the Remediation Technology Symposium um, every October in Banff. Everyone loves that. But I mean, that session has over 80 technical sessions for our delegates to attend. So it's great for networking, but it's also great for professional development. Um, and then in the spring, we, we host EnviroTech here in Calgary, and that covers a broader base um, of all types of the environmental sector. So we really want to see our members have corporate success and any way our association can help them, that's what our goal is. Yeah, and I think, so, the, so having attended those conferences and being to those events, you also see that there's a lot of international representation that continues mm -hmm. to grow and grow each year, right? And of course the pandemic has thrown things off, but, but what we notice is that Canada really is leaned on as an expert in the field when it comes to managing environmental concerns. You know, we've got people coming in from worldwide asking us for our expertise and our opinions. And the members that you're talking about, I mean, they're individuals that would hold professional designations, right? We're talking about chemists, biologists, engineers, geoscientists, um, foresters, just you name it, those professional designations and, and very thorough regulations in the environmental industry as well too, which require professional sign off, right? So a code of ethics that you're working with as well too, to say you've got a professional who's an expertise in this field signing off on what's being done out on site that can hold them to a certain standard, right? And I think that also helps to elevate the conversation and understanding that we, we in large part are not only doing things to a level that's never been done before, but we're setting the bar for, for the rest of the world in some, in some points, right? And what we all, I'm sure, can share is that we know that we can do so much more and we can do it better. I don't think that anybody would come to the table and say, no, 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 we've, we know enough or we've done enough. We all, I think, challenge each other in wanting to grow and moving forward, right? And that site rehabilitation program I mean, that was, that was for those that, you know, if you're not familiar with the program itself, that was federal funding that came to the table throughout the, the pandemic to put people to work so that we hopefully didn't lose the talent that we had in these areas that also focused on Indigenous relations, trying to put um, educational opportunities and job opportunities on the table for First Nations and Inuit and Métis so that we could actually move the needle forward in that in a meaningful way for sustainable jobs moving mm -hmm. forward. And like you said, it was um, a bit of a challenge to, to start those conversations, but at least at least you could you could represent, right? Mm -hmm. And Kelly, what about um, what about CLRA? Well, uh, CLRA has been in around since 1975. It is our 40, 46th year this year. Um, CLRA was founded um, uh, in Ontario, basically, by two uh, reclamation-based practitioners, 
and they basically uh, established reclamation as a profession in Canada. And so um, CLRA is uh, about 350 members across Canada, and a large group of that is a corporate piece of the membership. Um, and uh, we basically facilitate um, exactly like Isa, you know, technical learning, coming together, um, driving reclamation as, as a profession and reclamation knowledge base and ensuring the sharing of knowledge throughout the profession. So um, I'm proud to say that um, I've been a personal member of the CLRA for over 20 years myself since I've graduated um, university and, and uh, it's a, a great organization. Um, a lot of the things that we do within Alberta focuses on sharing knowledge, just like ESA. Uh, we do hold our annual conference. We typically have between five and 750 attendees annually. Um, we really try to incorporate the students, and uh, we do have partnerships with uh, a lot of the major colleges and universities within Alberta. Um, we've really focused on ensuring that we have that succession planning of reclamation professionals and practitioners within Alberta and, of course, across Canada as well. Um, Alberta is the largest chapter of the CLRA, which goes to show you that although we have the largest footprint of disturbed lands with our oil and gas development, we have also the highest level of professionals within Canada. And that, to me, is a, a huge go forward for, for especially reclamation and environment and sustainability. And one of the things that we want to focus on um, in Alberta is going towards more of a governance-based uh, model where we have different subgroups within the Reclamation Committee so that we can facilitate learning um, and also not just reclamation education, but that pre-development planning. And that's something that I think really we do in Alberta, and I, we really want to foster that you know, these large footprints from oil and gas mining don't just occur. There's a lot of fore planning, thought, pre-disturbance, you know, all that piece kind of ties in. So, um, you know, as an association, it's not just the back end that we look to, it's also the front end. And a lot of our professionals and practitioners practice in both the pre-disturbance and the disturbed land portion of reclamation. So I think that's really important for people to understand that reclamation just isn't focused on traditionally fixing disturbed lands, it's a process mm -hmm. and it's a, a systematic, systematic um, uh, piece where everyone works together to balance so that we can get equivalent land capability. So um, from a national perspective, um, I'm the vice president of the National Association. That is a strategic based board. We do support the chapters. We have chapters in Alberta. We have a new chapter in Saskatchewan. Um, we, have, we have people in Manitoba, not an official chapter as of yet. Ontario, Quebec, and of course uh, the eastern provinces. So um, on that board we focus more on how do we increase our membership, how do we increase learning, and how do we work together in, as professionals across Canada, and, and how can we facilitate reclamation um, so that people are aware and that it is an awareness that we have professionals that make sure these development projects um, look like there was nothing there at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of in a nutshell what CLRA is about. Thanks Kelly, and I think that really says it well as well too. I, what I've known is being, you know, so Agate is the company we work across Canada, right? We've got locations coast to coast. Our environmental division is, is also located coast to coast. And so what we do from the environmental perspective obviously changes based off of the industries that are there. One of the things for the oil and gas industry that I've always appreciated is that we've, we've gotten really good about understanding the challenges at the forefront of what we're dealing with. And when we're looking at trying to clean up a site that might be contaminated with hydrocarbons, for instance, that is not nearly as complex as trying to complete or um, clean up a site that's contaminated with PFAS or persistence organic pollutants or you know, a dry cleaning site that has many more complexities. And you know, I, it, it makes, it, sometimes I, I find it a little bit comical and I think to myself, if I was gonna choose where I wanted my house located, it, based off of what I've been shown maybe in, in media at times, you know, you, you want to shy away from this industry because that's what you hear, that's what you know. And I never would have thought that I should be concerned about, you know, looking to see if there was a dry cleaner beside me or if there was a chemical company down the road, right? Um, so I, I think we've, we've come a long way. Again, so much further to go, but it's definitely come a long way and we do know, we do this work quite well. So um, Chris... Moving on to, to some of uh, your areas of expertise and discussion. So when I first came across you, um, I, I was watching 
I, I think I saw you present at the Petroleum Club first in person, live in person. And then, of course, I saw you become this YouTube sensation and you kind of joke about the fact that you had to lean on some younger some colleagues <laughs> to, to, to show you how to do that. Um, but you, I mean, you've obviously, you've got, you've got a, a large length of experience, right? And so, so many individuals would have a large understanding of, of you and from so, so many years throughout that. But you really um, set a bar in, you know, not just in, in Alberta or Western Canada, but throughout Canada. And like you said, helping to calm the conversation at a time when it was, it was really needed. And then of course we went into the pandemic and so everything became more complex with the com pandemic and we all had to put certain things on hold. But um, your plan B presentation. So again, if, if you have not seen Chris's plan B presentation, it's out there on YouTube and I urge you to take a look at it. But a lot of it also relates into the updated presentation you've just done for us. Can you talk to us about why that was important for you to start getting the message out and what that meant to you and why you think it's so important that we do have this dialogue and conversation to help calm, calm the waters? Uh, well, good question. You know, I, I, uh, I have to say what, what got me started is uh, because I'm not a person that seeks the limelight <laughs> or anything like that. I, uh, you know, I, my life is private. I like to keep it that way. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I am an Albertan, but more than anything, I'm a passionate Canadian. And it really bothered me to see Alberta always being painted in mm -hmm. such a poor light. Mm -hmm. uh, and I spent a lot of time in Ontario because I, I have a cottage there. My mother lives there. Uh, my wife's family is from Quebec. I have a daughter in Halifax. You know, you go across the country. And, uh, but particularly in central Canada, I'd say there was a, a negative impression of Alberta. And it bothered me to see one Canadian against the other, a divided country. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, I thought, I, I have to speak up. I, I have an opportunity to, and I have to speak up. So uh, quite by accident, uh, one of my U talks uh, uh, was noticed on YouTube and started to get a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, as I mentioned when we were speaking before, <laughs> older guy got schooled. I thought, wow, this social media is pretty powerful. <laughs> so uh, I started to do a bit more of it. And I, I tried to do it uh, as much as I could outside of Alberta, yeah. because that's where, uh, you know, I think we needed to build the bridges. And, and of course, people in Alberta get very frustrated. They say, you know, how come those people in Ontario or Quebec or British Columbia don't know what we're doing here? Yeah. And I tell them, I said, well, you know, let's look at it from the other end of the telescope for a second. How much do you know about what's going on in the auto industry or the fisheries industry mm -hmm. uh, or the uranium mining industry? You know, you don't know anything because you're not in that industry. Yeah. So don't expect people in the rest of Canada to look at what we're doing or know what we're doing just because it's important to us. It's up to us to get out there and tell them what to do. Uh, and that takes time. It's not something you do overnight. It's not uh, one single YouTube or speaking engagement. Uh -huh. uh, and it takes a lot of people. And there, I think there are quite a few people uh, doing that now. Uh, I think there's quite a few people who are doing it very well. So, uh, so that's what got me going. It was uh, uh, you know, a concern for the country, uh, the, the division. The, and it's really easy from any part of the country to uh, condemn or vilify people far away. Yeah. You know? It, it, any issue, you know, you look at the country that gets divided on and you're like, oh yeah, those people over there, you know, you don't know them, they're far away, they're somehow bad and they're different. Oh, and they're not different, they care about the same things you care about, they want a good life and a better life for their kids. We're all the same, we have similar values. Uh, it just takes a bit of communication. Yep. So, uh, so it's up to us, so I did my two cents worth. Yeah, and I, and I think that's so important. And I mean, this again, this is, this is just one example of a conversation that I think has become so divided across the country, very sadly. I mean, um, I've never seen Canada at a time when it feels so fractured in so many ways. I still think that there's so much hope and optimism there, but it's it's tougher to see. You have to work through a lot of layers at times. So I, I you know, I appreciate people like yourself coming forward and, and taking the initiative to say, okay, we need to start doing better because it feels like you know, historically we would have trusted individuals to have these conversations for us. And now we have to start having them ourselves. And I think, you know, as a leader, um, I, I've always tried to look at the fact that the best way to lead is to be able to, to listen, to truly listen, yeah. right? And I really appreciate that every single day I can come to work and I'm surrounded by a bunch of other leaders that challenge what I say and vice versa, I challenge what they say. 
but we do it in a respectful way and I'm better for it and I hope that they feel that they're better for it and at the end of the day the decisions that we're making I'm hoping are much better than any of the decisions that we would make on our own because we are seeing each other's sides and we're taking into account a viewpoint that we've never never thought of or never felt and now it's very easy for us to continue to feed ourselves information that supports whatever ideologies yeah. we have, right? You know, if we were all to switch our cell phones today, whatever feed I'm getting is not going to be the feed that you're getting or you're getting or yeah. you're getting, right? And so we can keep fostering this when really we need to be surrounding ourselves by individuals who don't think like us and starting to have the conversation about why. Well, I think too, uh, historically, the energy industry, the communication it has done, which has been very little, has been, uh, you know, you're wrong, let me tell you how it really is. Yes. And that's not a very effective way to communicate. I think the first thing we need to do, because the whole energy environment issue is, is two sides of the same coin, mm -hmm. you know, the, you can't separate the two, is it's a crucial issue, it's an important issue. But I think the first thing to do is acknowledge people's fears. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're right, there's a big problem here. Yeah. And we all need to address it, you know. And so instead of just telling people, you know, you're wrong and here's the right answer, you know, that, that's not effective, it's not correct. And I think the first thing we need to do as an industry is acknowledge their fears. Yeah, the environment's a big issue and we need to address it, all of us. Yeah. And let's start from there. We're all on the same page here. Yep. And I think, you know, again, in your presentation, you talked a lot about the fact that oil and gas has a place. But, you know, you're just, a, just as supportive of saying that renewables has a place and a future energy transition has a place, right? And we need to talk about how to get there. But it's very important that we actually have a plan to get there and yeah. we understand what that plan <laughs> looks like, right? So That's the hard part. <laughs> yes, that's, that's ab absolutely the hard part, right? And so, you know, we've, we've talked about um, some of those shortfalls in the pre presentation itself. But do you want to maybe highlight on a couple of the areas where you feel like Maybe as Canadians, we, we, we are setting a bar, but we don't actually have a mark or an accountability path to how to meet that bar. I, uh, I have to be careful how I answer that because I try to be very <laughs> apolitical in my comments. Yeah. Uh, I'm not here to support any political view or party. I'm here to uh, talk about energy and the environment. Mm -hmm. But I do find it, and I point at all political parties when I say this, uh, I find it infuriating and I find it irresponsible that we have these discussions, and I'll, I'll use the last election as the example. They each had their goals for emission reduction by 2030, and the Conservatives stuck to our Paris commitment 30%. The uh, Liberals started at 30%, but then in one week moved to uh, 36 and then 45 within six days. Uh, and then the NDP said, well, we're going to have a 50% reduction. And the Green Party, of course, had been the Green Party, had to go further. So they said that we're going to reduce 60%. Uh, but not one of them had any plan of how to get there. Sorry. And so, like, I'll vote for 90%, but th that's just fun with numbers, you know? Like, it doesn't mean anything. So, uh, and the reason I find it irresponsible is it divides people. Like, you know, oh, yeah, we should go with the uh, NDP at 50% instead of the Conservatives at 30% or the Liberals. Well, none of them have a plan how to get there. And discussing those numbers, which are really just fun with numbers, it doesn't reduce emissions by a single molecule. Let's start by discussing how to meet our objectives of 30% reduction, which is a huge task. Mm -hmm. That is no easy task. And to this day, we don't know how we're going to get there. And then see how we can get beyond that. But let's actually focus on what we can do to actually reduce emissions and get there and stop these political games, this political fun with numbers that all parties are guilty of. Again, I'm not picking any sides here. Yeah. And let's start taking some responsibility and some action. You know, let's actually reduce emissions. That is the ultimate goal. I think in all this arguing, we forget what the goal is. The goal is to reduce emissions. Yeah. Let's focus on that. And you know, it's, it's very interesting because I, and I, I'm with you on the fact that I, I, this, these commentaries are meant to all be apolitical, right? The, the entire idea is that whoever can find a path, all the power to you because that's, yeah. that's what we want, right? It doesn't matter what party you're in. It doesn't matter who you are. But at the, the end of the day, we want to get to a goal and we want to see results, right? But, but we've all been in there. Kelly and Stacey, I'm sure that you've, you've each had many scenarios where you're sitting across from a client 
and they have a goal in mind. And maybe it's because they're looking for a particular investing investors to come to the table. Maybe it's because they're looking at a new land acquisition and they want a deal on it or whatever the case might be. And they're putting a goal in front of you that you absolutely know is not going to be realistic to hit because you were the experts and your teams are the experts, right? And then you're trying to, to tackle how we are going to, to get them to understand that's what real, what's realistic might be here. It's going to be better than where you were at, but it might be here. And then we can find a path forward, but we can't just leapfrog without being able to actually have the tools or resources, right? So one of the things that has been interesting is that we have seen, so we saw in COP26 um, the net zero commitment for, for 2050, right? That's been put out by the federal government. Mm -hmm. We do expect that we'll receive a release of a, a plan in March and get an understanding of what that looks like. Ahead of that, though, um, for the oil and gas industry, we've seen major producers come to the table with the commitment to say net zero emissions by 2050, and some of them have a path to get there. And again, Chris, in your presentation, you kind of noted it. Part of that path is things that we have within our control right now, things we can do immediately. And by we, I mean the producers mm -hmm. can do immediately. Yeah. And part of that is going to be innovation and technology and, and new ways of, of thinking. And that's going to be the challenge is, can we do that by 2050? So Cece, let's go back. And, and Kelly, you can weigh on this, because I know that you've seen the, the challenges as well, too, both within um, the associations and your own companies. Over the last couple of years, we have seen talent leave, right? And that's the sad, the sad state of affairs. And we knew that was going to happen. We, we kind of rang this alarm bell very early on, saying, if we don't put these individuals to work, yeah. they're going to go elsewhere, right? So we've seen um, talent leave. We've also seen an incredible drop in the graduating class, the size of the graduating classes coming out of these environmental programs as well, too. And then we've you know, compounded with that. We've seen the stigma of particular industries being hit where individuals, even if they are focused on the environmental sector, they don't want to go into those industries because they feel like it doesn't align with, with where they're at, right? So all of that compounded does not leave us in a situation where we have a lot of hands to work. So how are, how are you feeling from both the memberships and, and your um, career experience right now? How are you feeling with the labor market and the talent right now? Yeah, I would mirror everything you just said right there. I know our membership has been saying that for even before uh, COVID in 2020. Just the um, the price of oil and gas. It's I mean it's it's very well known fact that as soon as the price drops, so does the amount of investment in environmental work, and whether that's well abandonments all the way through. Um, it's yeah. it's one of the first to have their budgets cut. So. Um, I think anyone who's been working in oil and gas on the energy or the environment side, there is, it's cyclical. There's, there's busts and booms and we've all rode that wave for you know, 20 years, you know, and more. Um, I think in the last, I would say since the end of 2014, it's been a harder, longer hit. And I think those that had an opportunity to whether it was to retrain and hit another sector, took that opportunity. I think um, people who are coming out of school, thinking about what they wanted to take in university, were looking at the extended downturn and thinking, so I spend four or five years in university, I, I get the education, am I, am I gonna get a job? Mm -hmm. And then how long will I have that job? Um, so I think that's compounding the issues. And on top of that, I think, especially for the energy sector, there are students who went into environmental sciences, but over the past, you know, again, five, six, seven years, there's been a negative connotation with anything to do with oil and gas. Mm -hmm. So even if you're working, you know, you're trying to do the good work on the environmental side, um, we've heard from our membership that there are new grads who do not want to be associated um, working for an oil and gas company or working for a consulting company that works on behalf of an oil and gas company. They would like to take their, their knowledge and what they've learned in school and then apply it to a different sector. So um, in my experience in, in my 20 years, this has been the hardest to find people to fill the roles that we have open right now. And yeah. I think we've heard that from the vast majority of our membership as well. So. It's it's same for the CLRA. We've actually seen a decline in membership because 
people leaving the industry and companies going under. So corporate memberships have gone down. From a you know a, a North Shore perspective, um, it's like all of our peer companies, Agate, JSK. It's hard to find people. There is that group of intermediate employees that have left the industry. We call them the unicorns. They're hard to, you can't find them. They've left, they've gone and done different careers. So it's definitely challenging for the industry on a path to move forward. And we are seeing less and less juniors join into the industry. So from the CLRA perspective, we've really uh, tried to engage with the colleges and, and get people excited and, and have that mentorship piece for those new grads and students. But even at the CLRA, we have schools that we have scholarships we want to give out, but the schools don't have the students to provide the scholarships to. So it's really, it's, it's unfortunately a really big challenge. And even from the liability perspective, um, you know, I've done acquisitions and divestitures for years, supporting our oil and gas clients on that side of the business. And typically we would see, you know, a, a, an acquisition maybe fail because of a highly contaminated gas plant or something like that, typically related to soil and groundwater impacts. Now I'm seeing acquisitions fail because they don't have their emissions under control. They're paying too high of greenhouse gas. They're paying taxes. So it's really interesting how we see the flip in the industry in terms of what we consider a liability and how we manage that. So um, from my perspective, it's just going to be interesting to see if we can continue forward and how do we engage new people and how do we engage new processes and technology so that we can improve our industry and have some, um, some you're right, settle the oil and gas industry. When I graduated from university in 99, there was no jobs. Mm -hmm. I applied for 65 jobs. I got one interview and it, and it was because I knew someone. And you know, at that time, you got laid off every summer mm -hmm. or laid off in the winter because you worked in the summer, you got laid off. Um, a lot of jobs were, were just temp jobs, right? And we're finding that again as, as an employer, we're more comfortable hiring for a few months period when we know we have work. What we need is sustainability of work. We need something put in place so that there is a sustainability, so that there's guidance and, and buy-in by oil and gas, which we do have great buy-in from a lot of our large producers, um, to continue and do the ethically responsible and clean up the oil and gas sites. But that needs to be sustained. And it, you know, exactly every time there's a downturn, the first thing that gets cut is environment. So it's hard to have a career where every recession you lose 25% of your working population. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, it goes back to the conversation about we want to do the right thing, right? We all, all of us, so many individuals here really truly care and you want to be able to do the right thing. And we have the expertise, had the expertise, hopefully have the expertise to do it, but we, we, you know, we do know what we're doing, we do it very well, we can continue to do it and continue to develop, um, but we can't keep losing it, otherwise we're always gonna be behind the gun, right? I used to spend a lot of my time internationally when we had our investment banking firm. We started in Calgary, but we ended up opening offices in uh, London, England, Singapore, Buenos Aires, Houston, and Denver. And I spent uh, a huge amount of time in those offices. There was a, a couple of years I'd spend a, maybe a day a month in the office here, and then I was traveling. And everywhere I went around the world, uh, I'd meet Canadians working in energy, uh, mm -hmm. teaching people how to develop resources responsibly. Yeah. And, uh, and they all looked to Canada uh, as uh, the, the high watermark for uh, responsible development. Uh, if I can tell a little story, when we opened our office in London, England, I. Uh, uh, we were just starting there. We were just, nobody knew who we were, and I thought, well, if we're going to be busy here, we better introduce ourselves. So I called the deputy minister of energy. It was called the Ministry of in Industry, I think, at the time. And I thought I better introduce ourselves. So I call up his office. I speak to his assistant. I, my name is Chris. I'm from Calgary. We're starting an office here. We want to be involved in transactions. I'd like to come introduce our firm. And she goes, uh, just a minute. This gentleman comes on the phone, and I tell my story again. Hi, it's Chris. And he said, well, why don't you come by at 1.30 in the afternoon? And I said, well, okay, that was easy. <laughs> so I, I dropped by and, uh, and I said, well, before I introduce myself, I just want to thank you for letting me barge in the door. And uh, he said, well, you had me when you told me you were from Calgary. He said, you know, I worked here when we discovered uh, oil in the North Sea. And we had no idea what to do. 
So we went around the world and we looked at all these environments, like where do we have a regulatory environment that allows for the responsible development of oil and gas? Mm -hmm. And he said, my colleagues and I ended up spending six months in Calgary at the ERCB, which is now the AER, of yeah. course. And uh, we based our regulations on what you do. You're the best in the world. And I thought, why do I have to go to England to hear that? Yeah. And at home, I hear people are embarrassed to be in the energy industry. You know, they, our opponents have so successfully vilified our industry mm -hmm. that young people don't want to go into it. And it's a real yeah. shame because we are good at what we do. It's a difficult industry. We do it a lot better than we did any time in the past. And there's room for improvement going forward. But we're very good at what we do. And we're recognized uh, for that internationally. But in Canada, uh, we've been so successfully vilified. And it really bothers me to hear it when I, and I, of course I know this, I've heard, you know, talked to many young people too who don't want to go into the energy business. Yeah, and you know, it, that's a, a perfect segue into part of the next point as well too. And, um, and that's, so <clears throat> what's always fascinated me and, and frustrated me, to be honest, is that we, we are doing what we think is right and then patting ourselves on the back thinking that we're, we're being successful, right? So as Canadians, we're saying the environment is so important and we wanna fight for it and you know, here's our emissions plan and we are going to reduce this and then we're gonna, and if we get to that goal, we're gonna you know, all congratulate one another and we pat ourselves on the back and, and we're happy for the children and we go along our way, right? But the environment is not, it is not a concern for Canada. And especially when we're talking about emissions, it's not a concern for Canada. It is a global oh. concern. And the last time I checked, we don't have borders, impenetrable borders, that just allow us to work on our own little ecosphere that, that keeps us in our, in our bay, right? We are at the mercy of everything that goes on worldwide, just like the rest of the world is at the mercy of whatever goes on here, right? And again, Chris, going back to your presentation, you did a great job about talking about you know, Canada's portion in this, the, 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 global, the global setting for where we're at for emissions and reduction targets and everything else. And it's always fascinated me that we, we have these forums that are supposed to be talking about what our plan is globally, and yet they all come out and it feels like it's very siloed approach to say, okay, well, here's each of our targets. But I don't know that that's the best path for, for a, a world view, right? And part of what leads into that is that there's this big focus on ESG, right? You can't go anywhere, you can't, mm -hmm. can't get an investment dollar, you, can't, you don't want to invest, you've got you know, the stock market pushing on it, you've got definitely public, publicly traded companies under this, but ESG isn't just E, right? <laughs> it's not just the environment, it's environment, social governance. And that social piece, to me as, an, as a person, is so uniquely important, right? Gender equality, you know, ethical treatment of, of humans, um, all of that, you know, factors in to what I, I, I'd say should be part of making a sound decision. So when I look at, you know, the state of the environment in the world perspective and what our emission targets should be, in my mind, I feel like those conversations should say, okay, if as a world, as like throughout the globe, we need to reduce by this much, and we take away Canada's energy portion of this, if Canada's decision is to pull out of, of the game, what does that do to the rest? Mm -hmm. Whose energy sources are we using? And are those more sustainably or responsibly produced? Are those more ethically produced? And I know we, these conversations come up, but it's very easy for us to not actually sit back and think about how impactful that is if it's not in front of our face, right? And I think that's the danger is that Canada's in front of our face, so that's what we're focused on. Mm -hmm. If we were sitting on another site, watching child labor take place, or human trafficking take place, or watching mm -hmm. oil spill onto the ground with no environmental regulation to clean up, we might think twice, but that's not in front of us. So as Canadians, we're just pretending it doesn't exist, but it does, right? And you've been in the investment world, yeah. so. I mean, when you see oil and gas <laughs> produced around the world, and then you come home, it is a different standard, and there are other good standards too. Yeah. We're not the only ones, but uh, there are other uh, venues of very high standards. But I do think you're right. I do think the common perception is uh, that Canadian emissions affect Canadian climate, yeah. uh, which is, uh, you know, on the global scale, uh, <laughs> obviously, uh, that's not the way it works. Uh, but I do think the, the argument for uh, ethical oil is, uh, 
isn't going to carry the day because, uh, again, our objective is to lower emissions. Yeah. And if we just continue to produce and consume the way we currently are, we're not going to reduce emissions. But again, it's always easy to be, uh, as I say in my talks, an environmentalist when you tell the other person what to do. It's really hard when you look at what we have to do. I can tell you one way to shut down the Canadian energy industry tomorrow. Everybody stop using oil right now. Yep. But it's so much difficult on the demand side, and people aren't willing to reduce their demand for the most part because they enjoy their lifestyle, they enjoy their cars, they enjoy traveling, they enjoy seeing their families, they enjoy taking their kids to soccer and hockey and everything else. That all takes energy. Mm -hmm. So it's really easy to, to vilify the producer and as a consumer, and I'm one of them too, I'm not pointing fingers, I'm as guilty as anybody, we continue to demand. And so when I go to other parts of Canada, other parts of the world, and you see how people are using energy as if there is no tomorrow, uh, it's easy to vilify the producer. But uh, there's two sides to this, and everybody has to act better. I'm not trying to give the, cons the producers a free pass. Producers have to do better too, mm -hmm. but so do the consumers, yeah. right? or else we're not going to get anywhere. Yeah, that's, a, I think, a... A great, great point, right? And and again, very, very well, um, well defined in your presentation as well too. So, it it comes down to if it's not needed, it doesn't need to be to be resourced, right? Yeah. It, it it if there isn't that demand, there doesn't need to be that supply. But we've talked about you know population growth increasing. We've talked about further demands third world countries needing to kind of come out of, of poverty. And then there's also the part where, you know, in your presentation, you referenced a, a quote from Dale Swampy. And Dale's, um, so he leads the National Coalition of Chiefs, and he's actually joining us on our Indigenous Relations panel. So he'll be talking a little bit about it as well. But there's also that whole tie to the, the um, First Nation communities across Canada that have bought into massive projects moving forward and are hoping to take more and more ownership of these projects to get their populations out of abject poverty and, and continue to provide sustainable opportunities moving forward. Um, and, and Chris, I know you and Dale actually do a podcast or you're, you're launching a, a podcast, podcast yeah. together, right? And I think part of that is, is parts of these discussions, right? But it, so it plays into so many different facets of, of you know, what we can do within Canada. Well, I think, again, if you, uh, you know, go outside of Alberta, people think that, uh, and you can't talk about the Indigenous community as a monolith, a single voice. It's a community of millions with many different opinions. Yes. Uh, but there is very strong support for the development of resources, all kinds of resources, not only oil and gas. Yeah. Uh, and no industry in the country employs as many Indigenous Canadians as the energy industry, more, more than the federal government. Uh, and I don't think uh, Canadians realize that, that it uh, provides opportunity, relief of poverty. Uh, you know, this has been going on for generations in Canada, the, the terrible conditions our Indigenous Canadians have been forced to live in. It's not the only solution, but it's certainly part of the solution. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, I think going back to your comments, Stacey and, and Kelly, about being able to continue to have these opportunities for your membership, for future members, um, it takes the support and it takes the dollars and, and the funding, right? And we need to continue to do, to um, advocate for that to take place, especially as we see, you know, areas where commodity pricing is rising and, th and you know, we're getting out of some of these cycles and some of these downturns and hopefully we can get to a point where we can just further accelerate all of the work being done. And then again, also plan for, for a better future of what that looks like moving forward. And then also trying to continue to engage the conversation across Canada and some of the other energy forms, you know, going into to, um, the discussions about LNG and you touched on nuclear energy um, in the presentation, Chris, and then of course the, the renewables. You know, I think people really need to understand and, and I, you did note it in, in your presentation that there, there is no energy source that we will be using that doesn't have some footprint, right? Yeah. And I think that's very important no because- No such thing as impact-free energy. Right. Yes, yeah. there is no impact-free energy. That's a very good way to put it because I, I come across that a lot, right? People, that, that term green energy leads people to believe that there's just, there's no, no barrier to that and no impact. And that's, of course, as we know, not the case. Um, even when we're looking at the electric, electrical vehicles and everything else, we know that parts of those resource extractions that are going to be needed for those parts have footprints. But again, those industries have learned over time 
how they can manage that environmental imprint, how they can continue to better that. And that's what the discussion should be about. And it should be goal oriented, right? So if that goal is reducing emissions and getting to a target, then we talk about how we can plan to get that goal. And if any industry can meet that goal by changing their ways and becoming innovative and, and pushing dollars into research and development to find new initiatives, then that should be the goal met as opposed to the us dictating to any any one industry to say, don't do it at all, that you know, and, and don't worry about meeting the goal. Just st stop what you're doing. So, um, I know we have just uh, a few minutes left. The last portion that we wanted to kind of talk about was for each of you. What do you hope for the future of the environmental industry across Canada? And again, I, I want to preface it with saying we focus a lot about. Alberta and the oil and gas industry and, and, and energy and, and the industry out here and we hope to continue to elevate these conversations right through Canada and we want to welcome speakers and, and panelists that can highlight the work that's being done across the country but continue this dialogue. What do each of you hope for, for the future and where do you see this whole thing going? Who wants to take we'll start this at first? the end. <laughs> <laughs> nice, Chris. Nice. Gives me time to think. <laughs> well played. Um, I think it would be for me. It's every. It's a lot of the topics we've touched on. Um, I don't think the energy sector and the environmental sector. Um, you know, not just focused on oil and gas, especially oil and gas. But we don't tell the good story. We don't get our our collective good voice out there. We all know, those of us that are in these sectors, the fantastic work we do, the qualified professional people, the success stories we have. But to your point, Chris, when you go to British Columbia, you go to Ontario, I've been to conferences in other provinces and they have um, no idea about what we're able to do um, and the talent we have. So for me, to start to break down some of the divisiveness in this country, to stop the fracturing, to get on the same page, uh, to all the points about you know, Canada not having its own globe of environmental issues, it's a, it's a global thing, right? So for me, it's, we've been vilified, vilified a lot in the media. There's been a lot of non-Canadian sources um, making a lot of noise. I think it's time Canadians listen to Canadians and we share our story. And we have a lot of great success stories. There's a lot that um, we can all learn from each other and from different parts of the country. And if we can learn from the success stories, then maybe we can collaborate on the challenges. And, and in the end, everybody wins. So that's my hope for the future is that as a country, as an industry, we can tell the good story, we get our word out and we just get more positive work done for the environment. And if we can stop all the negativity that can be associated with the oil and gas industry at times, um, that maybe we can get further down the road to reducing emissions and not just talking about it. Yeah. So, yeah, awesome. yeah. Thanks, Stacey. I don't really know if I can really. Ask you. <laughs> <laughs> um, for you know, from from my perspective, it's really interesting because I do see Canada as fractured. I have family in in eastern Canada, and you know. It's always, oh, oil and gas is so bad. And one of the things I think people forget is that innovation comes from the dollars from oil and gas. When oil and gas is doing well, we get new innovative products, new technologies, mm -hmm. new growth ideas. And without oil and gas, where does that money come from? And how do we get better um, standards and, and what better ways to control emissions? So I think what people have to understand is that there really is a balance. And I'm an environmental professional, and I firmly believe that there has to be a balance between development and uh, sustainability. And I feel, as an environmental scientist, we can achieve that by doing the pre-development planning, ensuring that we're not impacting species of concern, that we're not affecting a specific waterway, that we, that we think about the air shed that we're going to be potentially you know, putting emissions into. So from my perspective, I think it's I think we really do need to get rid of that stigma and we need to work together. And you're absolutely right, Marissa, there is no clean energy. It's what is the best ethically responsibly sourced energy. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kelly. 
Uh, well, I have the benefit of uh, being a little older than you two, so I have a historical perspective. Uh, and and, and, and uh, I hope, uh, in terms of my comments, uh, end, uh, end on a positive note. Uh, you know, every generation has their challenges. Mm -hmm. You know, my parents' generation, uh, my parents are European, was the, the Second World War. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously unimaginable devastation. Uh, in my generation, it was pollution, water pollution, air pollution. You know, Love Canal here in the environmental business. Uh, I grew up in Toronto by the Don River uh, in the 1960s. It was a cesspool. Yeah. Cars abandoned, washing machines, tires. I was a young boy. I thought it was great. But uh, you go there today. I go out. My mother's still there. I go for a run along the Don River. Beautiful trees, waters crystal clear, nice pathways. You know, we solved those problems. Mm -hmm. And today's generation uh, has had this fear instilled on them that the world is coming to an end. You know, climate change, the world's over. Uh, I look upon it differently. This is a huge time of opportunity. Mm -hmm. Whether, you know, it's uh, STEM day, as you said. Uh, look at all the science you can pursue to make it an even better world. And my generation has had the best quality of life this planet has ever seen. And I want my kids to have an even better quality of life. So get to work, solve these problems. There's a world of opportunities out there in how to create better energy, how to use it better how to deal with the issues we have. It's opportunity to lead to even a better world, and I'm very optimistic. When I spend time with students, and I love spending time with students, I always leave optimistic. You know, they're keen, they're full of uh, you know, you know, energy, they're smart. Yeah. Uh, get, and look at the resources they have today, yes. you know, with the, the internet and all the science and the technology that's going on. Uh, this is a time of great opportunity. Yes, we have this very serious problem, and that leads to a lot of opportunity. Let's get at it. Yeah, I think that's it's all so well said. All of your all of the commentary there. I I sat in a presentation earlier this week on decarbonization. It was um, there was a, a, a variety of different speakers and they did a really well, a really great job. But you know the comment panel was going on throughout the presentation and it was one of the recent graduates who was the one to come to the table to say what this requires now and the whole you know the whole decarbonization discussion was trying to talk us realistically about an energy transition and emissions reduction. And it was the graduate student who, was, who came to the table and said, this takes unity, right? We're not yeah. gonna get through this. We're not gonna get through this without coming together. We're not gonna get through it without having the discussions. Nobody has a singular answer to this, right? So it really is about fostering the communication because I think we all really do want the same thing, right? And I think, you know, to the comments about the individuals, the, the students, I really hope that they are able to get engaged and excited and they feel that optimism about moving their careers forward because they're so drastically needed, mm -hmm. first yeah. of all. <laughs> um, but it, it's, I think, will be very fulfilling. I've worked with a lot of environmental professionals throughout my career, as well as working with the, the organizations. And I can't count the number of times where I've seen an individual just feel so much job satisfaction and fulfillment watching them take a site mm -hmm. that you know was a, a previously contaminated kind of barren site and building that back up into something that they could be proud of. And in some cases, giving back a park to a community or giving back children a place to play or just watching the trees grow so that you know the animals can rehabilitate and and so much of that, I think, again, like you said, Stacey, it's missed, and those are the stories that we should be talking about, and that's what we should be focused on doing better and better as we move forward. So let's hope that this kind of sets a tone for some more conversation and we can continue this evolving. But um, I appreciate each of you joining us today and all of the time. Uh, we will be taking questions and answers for the, the Tech Talk itself. And any, anyone who does want to get in touch with any of you will make sure to, to communicate that back to you if there's anybody that wants to reach out directly. But thank you to each of you. Thank you for all of the work that you do. And hopefully when we meet again, we've got some better news to continue to share and some key milestones that we can appreciate. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having us.